I'm glad to be here for many reasons. One, because Richland was the way that I went through my academic journey. And so I, I get very emotional when I, I, I get a chance to go back to, to Dallas. And then Eastfield was my first opportunity to work full time. And I was at Eastfield for two and a half years. And I remember so many of you. And the education pathway, the life pathways, I have an Eastern Kentucky accent now. So uh, <laughs> please, please, uh, if you hear that, it's my, it's my pride in, in, in my new state, Kentucky. I worked with so many people, so as I was going through the ranks, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was just doing it. And so you guys encouraged me to do my best to learn and expand. And so th this is an opportunity for me to give back. Thank you for the great introduction. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've done at, at the national level, level, level and, and, and the state level. And once again, I'm working on my pronunciation here. I apologize for that. Uh, so American Association of Community Colleges, I'm the president of the National Asian Pacific Islander Council. I have served as a member on one of their commissions, Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity. I also am part of their coalition of affiliated councils that are comprised of different groups that are interested in transfer pathways, that are interested in making sure people who go to community colleges know about manufacturing jobs, that people who want to be educators have that pipeline. So there are about 30 different commissions. And every time I go to those meetings, you know what they want to talk about? They want to talk about student success. What can we do to better serve our students? How can we better serve our community? And what can we do together to make it happen? Because the reality is, and I talked with some of you, the ingredients are here, right? We all know what best practices are. In some places, they're promising practices because they're unimplemented. But we need the opportunity to get that support, whether it's from the administrators, whether it's from the faculty, from the staff, whether it's from the community members, whether we get the money or not, depending on what the budget cycle brings, what the governor cuts, what the president gives, and, and all this stuff. You know, we talk about TRIO, we talk about Rising Star, which was established with, a, uh, with, with some scholarship funds. You know, we're talking about the TACIT grants where the, the Department of Commerce are giving people money so they can advise students. So, it's about collaboration and working together. So the title, Student Success, and I know we're focused tomorrow on learning communities and we are focused on first year experience. Everything goes hand in hand because if we cannot keep the students here, whether it's for a day or for a semester, then they're <laughs> definitely not going to be here the next week. And before some of the issues have occurred in the, in the country about other institutions of higher education, Students could really pick where they wanted to go. They could go to Richland, they could go to Eastfield, they could go to UTD. Now they can go to University of Phoenix, or I really love their commercial Southern Hampshire. Have you seen the commercials? And so I, I Googled them, and they're, they're a real university that's doing a great job marketing themselves, I guess nationwide, because what, what are they doing? They're, sh they're, they're showing and sharing that education can be accessible, it's available, and it's also based on the competencies learned, not just finishing a class. And so when a student finishes those competencies, then they can move on. And for somebody who's working, for somebody who's a family, or people who have a combination of, of, of those two things and many more, it makes it really convenient. So really excited to be here and talk with you. So in Kentucky, I would consider myself somebody who's involved. I served as the the chair of all the vice president of student affairs for the Kentucky Community Technical College System for a year. We're one of 16 colleges and we're always working together and working at our respective areas to talk about, hey, what are you doing? What can we do together? Because it's about collaborating and combining resources. And we'll talk about that during the presentation. So the introduction. I'm not going to go around and ask everybody where you're from because some people are embarrassed, and that's why I was really proud of these students. They did a great job, didn't they? They did a really great job. Uh, this is a conversation, so I know a little bit about a lot, and I'm sure you guys know a lot about everything. The, the thing is that something that works in one place may not work in another place, and something that works in one place may work better when you combine a community college and a university. And so how many people are here from a university? I know Texas A&M University, 
the big one, you know, part of the SEC, very, 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 uh, very loud and proud. And then Texas Women's University. Well, uh, Texas Westland University. Texas Westland University. And how many people are from the Dallas County Community College District? Great. I saw some people from Grayson, from Clinton. Any other colleges? Well, thanks for being here because this is great conversation and also great synergy. You guys definitely care about what you're doing and want to get more information. How many people served in a role as an advisor, orientation leader, admission staff, faculty member, some kind of administrator? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So depending on where you go, I, I saw there there are some system office people here. You know, depending on where you go and who you are, we're all part of the same team. So it, it's a great place to be. Okay. What is that? How many people have been there? Okay. How many people enjoy the experience? How many people have walked on it? How many people have driven on it? How many people have ridden a bike on it? Okay, so this is a beautiful icon that we have. And we're talking about education, it's a pathway. We are not the destination, okay? We are a pathway for somebody to get where they want to be. And we're just a resource for them because somebody coming to a community college, and I wish we had some more students here, I'm not putting students on the spot, there are any here. Why are you here? To get my education, to transfer. To great to get a good job. Nobody ever says I want. I always want to be a harvester. <laughs> you know that that's not that that's not the goal. And there's there's nothing wrong with that. But this is an opportunity to say, hey, I want to be a nurse. And this is the way that I'm going to take the first two years or three to get my education and then transfer to Texas Women's University, Texas Westlands University, University of Texas at Dallas. University of Texas at Austin, University of Texas. So it's about opportunity. But also, it's about an opportunity for me to get the quality of life because I'll have the skills that I can get promoted and move up and still go to school or I'll get my associate's degree and then be promoted, whether it's in a factory, whether it's in any role in, in an office or building. So I, I rode a bike on the Golden Gate Bridge, and I think one person rode it. Okay, two people. Okay, you know how hard that is to ride? So this is a beautiful thing. And so we rented a bike, and then we, we went around and saw the areas over here. And then once you actually go on the bridge, there's this big push of wind hitting you. And so I'm rolling and rolling and rolling, but I'm not moving and moving. And, moving. and so what I didn't want to do was fall. I didn't want to fall, because what would happen? This would not be fun. <laughs> this would hurt. Somebody would run me over. But would I want to get back up? Would I just pick up that bicycle and walk? And so for many of our students, and then I'm going to use the word students and learners interchangeably, because some people are students and some people are learners of life. I consider myself a learner of life. What if they get frustrated? What if they can't pick up that bike? What if they don't have somebody to, to help them? So you have something beautiful, something that they've always heard about or, or wanted to experience, and then they may have taken a fall. But there are a lot of people that are driving, a lot of people that are walking, and a lot of people riding their bikes. And so most of the time, they're not going to help them out, right? Because they're, they're enjoying their own lives. But there are going to be a few people who help out. And those are the types of people that are here. People who care about the student, students, the learners, and about other people. So it's exciting, very exciting to be here. So I'm assuming you guys are here for a good presentation and for the learning communities tomorrow, right? Yeah. But that's my assumption. If we talk about engagement, I really need to know why you guys are here. So can I get a couple of uh, volunteers? Why are you here today? So this is what usually happens when I'm in a group. <laughs> I told Kyle this, I said, yeah, when I'm talking to our faculty or, or, or other groups of people, and I ask for a response, sometimes it's really hard. Now imagine being in a classroom, being a student, and then the faculty would, would say, hey, you answer that question, or you answer that question. So I'll ask again. 
Um, well, here at, MS, at the Clinic Community College, we're just now getting to the point where faculty understand that they really need to be involved in the process of helping students become successful. And so I think it's really important for us to identify ways to encourage the faculty to do that, ways and methods that won't overwhelm faculty, but where we can really collaborate well together. Um, and just any ways of any new ideas, we have people that are very open right now to student success and everybody's really on board. So anything that I can take back, I think is valuable um, so that we can look at all the opportunities and options and really decide what works for us. Great. Great. I'm a faculty member at Cedar Valley College and I am always looking for ways to engage my students, keep them in the classroom, so retention and of course success. And um, I attended the QDE session that we had at the district conference, and I um, was really interested in the learning communities that were happening here. So I was really excited. Oh, yeah, two for two for one. Yep. <laughs> uh, very similar. I teach in QEP, and so I want to learn how to do it better. Thank you. Oh, I teach in the East Coast QEP. Anybody else? You have to document so many things of how you're doing, and so. Since I'm in research, I want to come and see if there's good ideas to where I can help with you. Create cohorts to do something where we can see. Mm -hmm. where you can, I know you're doing a good job where you can prove it for further grants. So something that's measurable, achievable, we'll talk about that later in the presentation. I think we have a couple people over here. Just to learn new ideas, see what everyone else is doing, what works, what doesn't work, and to be able to collaborate together. And Make the best experience for the student. Great. Um, mainly orientation, um, like really trying to grab them early and telling them all the resources and you know what all goes into college. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? So the common theme is collaboration, engaging people, engaging them early, engaging them often, and then sustaining that relationship. Right? Does that sound good? So Simon Sinek is a, is a famous author, and he works with a lot of businesses and, and, and industries, and he's a very recognized thought leader. All organizations start with why, but only the great ones keep their why clear year after year. Those who forget why they were founded show up to the race every day to outdo someone else instead of to outdo themselves. You know, the reality is there's so many things that we want to do, but then we have to be accountable, or somebody doesn't show up, or because of a budget situation, our resources are not where it wants to be. But if we stay true to ourselves, then we can, like the students say, motivate, stay motivated. In actuality, I think it's our job to inspire people. And that's to give them that, that flicker of hope, that opportunity to, of engagement, that orientation, that academic plan, to make sure they know what, what they're getting themselves into. Because it's not just a singular event or, hey, where do I want for my class? It's making sure that they know if I come in here, where am I coming out, and what am I coming out with, and some of the things that are along the journey. So who are our community college students? And I know that we have some university partners here. I wanted to focus a little bit about community college students. And I've been working with some of our, our local universities in Kentucky. And the, and, the, and the great thing is the fact that our community college students are your future university students. So I want to make sure that everybody has a baseline of who we are working with, and who we're serving. So about 12.7 million students are enrolled in credit and non-credit classes. Right? So these are degree seeking and these are hobby making and you know, learning different skills for fun or for a certificate or, or for an associate. The average age of community college students is 29. Depending on where you are, it could be a couple years less or a couple years uh, more. And then the enrollment status, about 41% of community colleges, college students are enrolled full-time and 59% are enrolled part-time. So just remember that that is a big part. And as we see in many sectors now in education, whether it's in administration or, or faculty, uh, there are a whole lot more, more females in, in, the, in the pipeline than males. So when we talk about these things, we also need to understand that diversity, inclusion, and, and opportunity, and equity are, should be embedded in our conversations because we're not just serving 
one group of people we're serving, everybody, and it's great to make sure that we do have that common language. I hope you guys don't think I'm ignoring you over there. Okay. Okay. The next group of stats I think are, are really, really important. 19% of full-time students work more than 30 hours. Okay. 19% of full-time students work more than 30 hours. This doesn't include the ones that work 15 or 20 or who have kids and stuff like that. But we know a majority of our students are part-time students. Look how many part-time students work more than 30 hours. About 41%. 41%. That's a lot because they're balancing multiple things, right? Now look at the second uh, set of data over there. 13% of full-time students take evening or weekend classes. Okay, these are full-time students. I'm assuming, and let me know if I'm wrong, that most of these students that were here today were full-time, right? And they seemed like they knew what they wanted to do because they wanted to get their education, they wanted to transfer. Many of the students that I work with and, and, and I hear about, they really don't know what they want to do. Some of them say, well, I want to go into nursing. <laughs> Why do you want to go to nursing? Because they make a lot of money. Yeah. Or because my mom told me, or because it's a cool job. But how many of them have actually taken a biology class, <laughs> or a phlebotomy class, or realized that nurses do more than just help people with bandages and stuff like that. They actually change, I'm not trying to get graphic, your hands. They have to carry people, flip people. I know we have a nurse in the house over there who may be two or three times more than what they weigh. They have to work with people who are on the verge of death. And so having realistic expectations, really, really important. 38% of part-time students take evening or weekend classes. Okay, so let's build something here. Let's, let's build this Lego. Okay, so a majority of students in community colleges are part-time. 41% of these students are working more than 30 hours. 38% of these students are taking evening or weekend classes. We just woke up this morning together in this conference, right? I don't know about you, but 4 or 5 o'clock, I'm tired. I'm beat. And if you have family members or other responsibility, you're trying to balance, hey, I want to see my wife, I want to see my husband, i got to see my kids, got to feed them, and then I have this, this class. So it's important that we understand people's situation. I see. Any questions about that? Okay, student aspirations, and this is from the, from the SESI data. These numbers are higher because the students could take more than, than one goal. So how many students wanted to complete a certificate program? 58%. So half the people that walk into our doors want a piece of paper that says, hey, you are certified to do this, whether it's welding or working with computers or cybersecurity certificate. Our certificate programs usually run between 12 credit hours and 18 credit hours, okay? You can either get them in a semester or two semesters. Obtain an associate's degree. 79% of people say, hey, I want to get an associate's degree. That's really cool, right? I work with a lot of universities in Kentucky, and we promote going to the community college, and we say, get your associate of arts, get your associate of science, get your AA, AS, AAS. And so I'm trying to, to work with people because we're very proud that Everybody here is accredited by the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, right? Because if we did not have that, we would not be legit mm -hmm. in our region, respectively. Okay? But the reality is, the reality is, some people don't know, don't care what associates means, right? Or what it is. They want to get a two-year degree. Mm -hmm. They want to go to community college, get the number of classes they need to transfer <coughs> to a great university, right? And so what we're trying to do is blend and integrate the language of AA and AS and AAS, which is a social applied science with, get your two-year degree, get your four-year degree. I know there are some philosophies out there, well, sometimes it takes more than two years or a four-year degree. And that's great. We just want to make sure that people understand when they come here that there's a timeline. You know, it's, it's measurable, it's specific. Don't just go here for like four or five years unless you want to. But if you come here and do the things that you need to do, especially with that academic plan, and in some places that academic plan changes like every year, <laughs> guarantee that once they get in that catalog, they can follow those requirements for graduation for that program.
then it's easier for somebody to say, hey, you know what? I'm in school. I'm not wasting my time. I'm not wasting my money. I'm actually getting something. Mommy, Daddy, why aren't you here? Because I'm getting my education so we can have that quality of life. Okay, student attainment. And some of the, these data sets are, are different data sets. The other ones were from SESI and AACC. And this is from uh, the U.S. Department of Education. So how many people who start off at a community who started a community college finish? How long do you think it takes somebody to finish at a community college usually? Five years, two years, three years? How about a four-year university? Six? Six to eight? Okay, you know, when, when they do data, they always talk about community colleges and they look at the time period of four years. So somebody going for a two-year education lasting four years. But then you have somebody working at a university four years. How, what is their six-year completion rate, you know? So this shows the completion of a certificate or a degree or somebody who transferred after six years beginning, beginning in college. It's at 45%. So if you're a glass half full person, that's really good, right? And you, you don't even have to be a glass half empty person. The reality is there's some opportunities to increase that number, right? Not only increase that number within six years, but increase it within four years, within two years. So Dr. Glazer talked about SENSE. Everybody remember what SENSE was? It was a survey administered to students to talk about and identify their experiences during their first semester, during the first three to five weeks. And so the original survey was called SESI the Community College Survey of Student Engagement. And so what they measured were similar things at first. Uh, what were the students' experiences with student services and things in the classroom? But the thing that SESI and SENSE differed on was, SESI was the original, but it measured a student's experience during the second semester of college. So that was great information, right? Getting information about these people during their second semester of college? If you agree with that, raise your hand. Okay, th that's great. But what happened? There's a lag because you don't get to measure those people who dropped off during the first semester of college. So it's great that Erica talked about SENSE and then we're talking about SESI. Because what I want to do is build <coughs> upon some of the things that she talked about, but from the experiences of a student, and I, I picked a, a couple of things, in the classroom, because we have some advisors, orientation leaders, we may have some students here, and we also have some administrators. So what happens in the classroom, if we know what happens in the classroom, and we're not faculty, we can work with people to say, especially our students, hey, these are some common things that uh, I, I found out. If, if you make friends with somebody, if you don't show up to class, you may be able to take their notes, so you may not be too far behind, or, hey, I know that you have a class in two hours. Can we meet together? Can you help me study? Because that's what we're doing now, right? We're collaborating, we're studying, we're working together. Some of us know X, some of us know Y. And then together we know X, Y, and Z, right? So some of the benchmarks. Active and collaborative learning. That's what I'm trying to do here. <laughs> Make sure that it's very engaging and that we're working together. And thank you all for, for sharing your, your knowledge. Student effort, academic challenge, student-faculty interaction, which is really key. How many people were here for the student session? Okay. Really smart guy that's transferring to UTD. Very complimentary to everybody. He said, well, thank you. You know, rising star helped me. All, all of you here, faculty, help me. And so in the education world, sometimes there are faculty, staff, administration, but he sees everybody as a faculty member. That's not a bad thing. The reality is when somebody comes to our college, steps on our grounds, everybody is a college employee. And so the, the term faculty may be a general term for somebody who they think will help them. So it's important, very important, 
that everybody provide that great customer service, engage them, whether it's the grounds person, which is really important. Why is that important? When you step out of your car or step off that dark bus, you get to see what the college looks like. I don't know about you, but I'm really very uh, happy and prideful of, of really clean, awesome looking spaces and places just like this facility. Who would want to go to a place where there's graffiti or trash on the floor? Because you also want to feel safe, right? And if you don't see all that stuff, is that an environment or are those the conditions that you want to be part of? Because you're spending a lot of your time and your money and then some opportunities from other people to invest. And so you want to make your investment count and you want to maximize your investment, right? Support for learners. And there are different ways. Michael was here earlier. You know, we talk about student engagement. We talk about student success courses. We talk about orientation, first year experience. The reality is, those are common terms. The reality is, how those are practiced and implemented could vary, right? We talked earlier about orientation being online. How many people have mandatory orientation? How many people have mandatory orientation that people actually have to show up to the college? How many people have mandatory orientation that could be accessed online or in person? Okay. I was talking with some of our friends at the university, and a local university as well. They have orientation, but it's for transfer students, but it's online. And, 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 and I feel that if somebody is going to be spending a lot of time and money, that they're probably not going to be on that campus, right? Realistically, probably going to be there for class or going to take their online courses. If you can connect with them or engage with them for an hour or two or three, whatever the setup is, that's probably going to be the best time and, and, and possibly the only time that they can learn your name, that they can find a place. And so I think it's important to have orientation that's mandatory, that's engaging. And it also is not just, hey, this is what we do here, but connect people physically, show them where things are, give them business cards, and then follow up with them. So active and collaborative learning. So what I did was highlight a couple of, of points which I thought were really interesting and based on conversations with, with my colleagues. They're really common and, and things that can be easily, easily discussed and in, in some cases encouraged so it doesn't happen or it happens more often. Okay, nearly two-thirds of students often or very often ask questions or contribute to class discussion. That's a good number, right? So two out of three people will ask questions in class. I remember when I was in high school, graduated from Richardson High School, I didn't ask questions. I was waiting for that smart person or the smart people to ask questions. Looking back at it, the reason I didn't ask questions, I didn't know what questions to ask. And so if you have somebody asking questions, you have different levels of people who really want to know what the answers are or who want to contribute by asking questions. You know, it, it, it's the, uh, the way to figure out what life is about by asking people what life is about and then experiencing it yourself. And then almost a quarter of respondents have very often or often worked with classmates outside of class to prepare class assignments. Okay. So all these people are, or most of the students that were here were part of a learning outcome. That is so powerful, working with somebody to make sure that the assignment that you do, that you actually do, and then when you turn it in, it's in a condition that is more likely to get you a grade that you want. And it's really easy when you have another set of eyes to look at it. And you have a captive audience. That's why it's important for us to facilitate a conversation and promote students working together. And I'm not trying to talk about, here, give them your cell phone number, give them your email address. Give them an opportunity to talk. What can we do to communicate more with each other? You know, can we meet before or after class? Things like that. Okay, student effort. Though half of, of students often or very often prepare two or more drafts of the paper before turning it in, over one-fifth never do. So what does that mean? How many history professors are here? English professors? Science professors? Okay, I have an assignment, right? And it's about the periodic table. 
and I have to write a paper about the periodic table, not just say what this means and, and all that stuff. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, if I practice, then maybe I could access a tutor or I could do what we said in the other, other slide and talk with somebody else about it. But usually, if it's your first, first piece of work, it's probably not your, it could be your best, but it may not be your polished piece of work. And so it's really important that uh, students have the opportunity to write down what they're thinking because it's an opportunity to brainstorm and then put what they think on a piece of paper and then they can ask other people what can I do or who can I speak with to help them out. Nearly half rarely or never use peer or other tutoring services. So how many people have some kind of learning lab, tutoring center? Okay, that's great. It's important, just like with the question about the degree plan, that students know that there are resources available to them. Because we spend a lot of time, we hire people. It's great to make sure that people know when and where these services are. But one of the, the great things we've been figuring out and, and talking about, I know some other colleges do this, they have some of their, their academically successful students serve as peer tutors. So it's not me or Cecilia talking to this person. It's their classmates saying, hey, you know what? I didn't understand that either. But if you do this equation or if you remember this acronym or this formula, it's going to make you more successful. And it also makes that other student a teacher. And some of the best things are learned when the, when the student becomes the, the, the teacher. Okay, academic challenge. Half of students often or very often work harder than they thought they could to meet instructor standards or expectations. Okay? I mean, how many, how many students are here? Great. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for being here. So that means people that are in school are actually wanting to do well, right? And they think that they can be successful. So if they can think they can be successful, it's up to us to give them the resources to be successful. And I'm not saying we'll do the work for them, but we make sure that they understand what the processes are so they can access the resources to be successful. And three quarters say their college puts quite a bit or very much emphasis on spending significant amounts of time studying. And we heard that with the panel. So what could you tell your sister? Oh, make sure that you study two or three hours for each class that you have. That's really, really important. It's not just what you may or may not learn in the classroom. It's what you as a learner and what our students, and since we have students here, you can call me a liar if you want, to, what, what our students need to make sure that the things that they wrote down, that they, the things they think they understand, they actually understand it. It's about processing information. It's not just collecting information. It's using it, integrating it, and making sure that there is a, a product, a deliverable, that can be shared with faculty or somebody that assesses it, because we're all about assessment. We're all about accountability. Because some of those things <coughs> lead to success, but we can't talk about accountability and assessment and have them limit <coughs> success. So we'll use those as tools to help us get where we want and need to be. Okay, student-faculty interaction. How many students here know another student who doesn't know their faculty's name? Oh. This is a great group of people. Because I think there was a, a person here earlier that, that, that had that situation. So I serve as the vi Senior Vice President of Student Organizational Success. What does that mean? It's a really long title, and I realize if it's a long title, it may not be as important as I, I think I am. So I work with student affairs, admissions, advising, the registrar's office, financial aid, some of our grant-funded, supported, student-supported programs, but I'm also in charge of, of institutional effectiveness in, in research. It's really important just to, to connect everything together. Uh, and one way that students connect it's through email. How many people use email? I know the question was, how many of you use websites? How many people use eConnect? Yeah? Okay. So over 63% of the students use email, compared with only 8% of students that never do. 
So we're talking about first year experience, first year success, student success. Make sure that when people communicate with us, we do our best to respond to them. Go ahead. Carol, who's your teacher, please, this class that just came in? <laughs> we really do, Gerald. We have droves of students who come into academic advising. And who is your professor? Uh, okay. I don't know. Ooh. How can you possibly learn something, do something, when you have put yourself under the authority of a figure and you don't know it? But this is not only those students. This is across the board in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we must get back to having a point of view. And the first thing you do to get class is what is the teacher's name? That's a great point because Dr. J, great class. They, they know your name. And I, 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 didn't, I didn't think that anybody in Eastfield or around this place uh, would, would be in that category. But that is a great point. The reality is if we are here to help or anytime that we need to help somebody, it's great to know what somebody's name is because that is a point of contact if we're assessing stuff and we don't know who that person is, we don't, I don't know, they might call Thursday maybe, or two o'clock. It's really important to, to be able to connect with people. And that way, when people are doing great jobs, we know they're doing great jobs. If people have opportunities to improve, we know what we need to improve because it's about continuous improvement and developing better qualities, better services for our students. But that, that, that's, a, that's a great thing. Some of the universities that I worked with or attended, you know, they have class rosters. So from a faculty perspective, they know their students' names for the most part, as long as their picture looks like what they look like in the classroom and they connect. Because I was, I was in school and I thought, wow, how do you know my name? There's like 30 other people here. That made me feel really, really good. Like they actually cared about me. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I just actually have a real quick um, kind of trick for the people that do teach. But if we don't have rosters like at Eastfield, um, I take my iPad on day one and I have them pose and I put it into their their thing. So they have I have a picture. Oh, okay. I will not know their names unless I have pictures. I study them just like they study homework. I study them. Yeah. So because I want to know them. So yeah. How many how many faculty members or staff people have their bios or their pictures on the website? Okay. So that, that's helpful for students too because some students, once they find out where they want to go, they actually do shop for classes. I know Kyle was talking about the, the, the event where students can meet their faculty members. They may not know how they teach, but they know how they treated somebody. Or they know how they smiled at them or said hi to them. And that alone sometimes means a big world difference. The majority of students report receiving prompt feedback from instructors on their performance with only 8% reporting they never do. So, how many people went to college? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, right? A lot of people. So how many people had some classes they really liked? Yeah. Why'd you like those classes? Because they were fun, because they were easy, because they led to your majors, or they helped you get a scholarship, right? Okay. What about some of those colleges you didn't like? I was in graduate school, and I took a test. And I thought, oh, well, I'm in graduate school. I'm smart. I took a test. And then I got, a, I think, a D or something. And it was my second graduate school course. Oops. Uh, graduate school course. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm stupid. I don't know what's going on. It was five out of seven identifications. It was like a couple of essays. So what happened? Well, I answered those five or seven things. I, I, wrote, I wrote like one or two lines. I was feeling good about myself, you know, even though it's a gerontology degree, I, I knew about aging, even though I was really young at that time. And then I wrote my essays. I wrote my essays. What happened? What happened? My expectations were not what the expectation of the faculty member was. Okay, so my five out of seven identification, short identification, my one or two sentences. He wanted a page for each of those. He wanted a page for each of those. So did I live up to his expectations? Obviously not, but my expectations were from what I experienced before. And what I experienced before, because that's what people use as their foundation, their prior experience, their prior learning, right? And so I thought five or seven short identifications, one or two lines each. But that's not true. 
I ended up getting a, a B in the class. I, that tells you I did really well on those uh, second and third tests. How many people share with their students some practice tests? Or some study guides? You know, those things are enforcers, are, are ways for you as students, for us as employees to help people. Because we may not be giving them, I think the dead spot is right over here. <laughs> so we may not be giving them the information that's exactly on the test, but who cares? We're giving the information and the strategies to be prepared for this test and beyond, right? I know there are some really passionate academic advisors over there and over here. <laughs> the majority of students report receiving oh, here we go. support for learners. Nearly three quarters of students say that their college puts quite a bit of very much emphasis on providing support they need to help them succeed. Okay, that's great. That means, you know what? You guys are here for me. I will be successful. Two-fifths say their college puts very little emphasis on helping them cope with non-academic responsibilities. Okay, so as far as my classes, you guys are all all-stars. I try to be, I just had ACL surgery a month and a half ago. And so my goal, my goal, first day was to be the all-star for physical therapy. <laughs> Not only was it to be the all-star, as Kyle said, but the MVP. <laughs> because the MVP is like the, mm -hmm. the highest, right? And so I have a 140 degree range of motion, okay? 140 degree range of motion. Why did I, why did I tell you about my personal life? Because I took a week off of school. Even though I worked, I took a week out of school so I could rehab. Okay, what if somebody has to take a day off for daycare? Or miss a class because... They have a flat tire. What are we doing to support our students? You know, from the very beginning, from orientation to, to degree. And I'm not saying, hey, here's a here's an amnesty card or, or a, a, a get out of jail free card like in Monopoly. I'm just using these as, as metaphors. Because things happen in life, so we have to find balances. But we also, if we don't have the resources for the students, we should do our best to connect with the local agencies because they have experts and they may be just a phone call away or a bus ride away or, or a car ride away. So, yeah. well, let's go back to that other statistics of only 8% ever report bad teaching methods mm -hmm. or inability to contact the professor. Mm -hmm. The United States has become status quo. You know, we don't, we can't improve unless you make your opinion heard. And students don't think that anyone will listen to them. And so we're kind of in a catch-22. You've got to make your voice heard or nothing ever changes. Oh, I agree. And we won't, we'll cover that. But if you look at your, uh, at your agenda, the cool thing, there's a session about social justice and being involved, so that, that's the great thing, is it's more than just about sitting in class, hey, how are you doing? I'm learning about anatomy or physiology. It's about what can I do to, to be part of a, of a greater society, because I'm more than just a student, I'm a learner, but I'm also engaged in my community, and I'm a leader in that community, too. Like all these students here, they were leaders, right? They did such a great job. Go ahead. sharing that I'm aware of. Um, I work in the library and can uh, um, oversee quite often. There's, there's some websites like Great Year Professor and things like that that students are very avidly following, you know, before they make a selection. <laughs> Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. And right, right, my professor is like open access, right? I like what you said because it, it's, it's up to the students, but it's up to us too. So for those that are in leadership roles, for those that review faculty feedback, for those who know how certain people work, it's, it's good to provide that feedback because we want to create a good, safe learning environment where people feel empowered. Some things people do, rate my professor, have anonymous surveys. But also, once somebody has a concern or a suggestion that we actually do something about it and the student knows that we did something about it, because 
there are sometimes conversations where I complain, but nobody did anything, or I email them, but nobody ever got back to me. So we need to be more accountable to and, and empower the students. And so we have we have protocol. Mm -hmm. The student must talk to the teacher about his or her issue, document it, and only then, when they haven't gotten any response, then are they allowed to move up to the next level and fight in the same way for the, for the next. But our students are often apathetic about even taking the very first step. So, and, and I think it comes from lack of respect. If you don't know who my, what my name is, I can't help you. If I don't know what your name is, it's going to be, uh, are you lost? Go that way. It's not going to be a true encounter. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be, there's not going to be any engagement happening. Mm -hmm. Good point. And some people are also scared. You know, I don't know how many people have canceled credit cards before or closed the bank account. You would hope it's an easy process, but they can make it last longer than it needs to be. And so we, we, need, we need to build and have resources where people can, can know the professor's name, but also if they have any issues, feel like there's something that's happening. Some schools have um, buds person or uh, a student affairs person, a judicial affairs people. There, there's different ways in different colleges to do different things. So the American Association of Community Colleges, they, they met a couple of years ago because we were talking about what can we do as an institution of, of higher education. You know, about half or more than half of all undergraduate students enter through the doors of community colleges. What can we do in our 100 plus years of history to make sure that we're providing the quality education, the excellent services, and the things that we need to do to be competitive in America and also nationwide? Because it's about jobs. It's about opportunities. And then mixing and blending and supporting all those things. So we need to evaluate where we are as, as a it's a group of community colleges in our mission. So the 21st Century Commission on the Future Community Colleges included a lot of faculty and staff from all over the country to identify what can we do to better serve our students? What can we do to better help our employees do their jobs? What can we do to let our legislators and policymakers know that we are actually here, that we're actually successful? So reclaiming the American dream Community colleges in the nation's future. That was a report they created a couple years ago, and now they released an implementation guide. Redesign students' educational experiences, reinvent institutional roles, and reset the system to better promote student success. So this next slide has seven recommendations, but I'm going to go, go through that and talk about the, the four common themes. So recommendations. Increased completion rates by 50% by 2020, and we've heard about that, right? Dramatically improved college readiness. Once again, the next slide I'll go over this. I want you to see the big picture. Close the American skills gap. Close the American skills gap. I'm going to stop real quick because something this one guy said earlier really touched me. And there's no right or wrong. Now, why don't you know what you want to do? It's not my priority but I want to experience it. So closing the American skills gap is making sure that people have internship opportunities, apprenticeship opportunities, externship opportunities, opportunities to go somewhere where they may want to work to see if they want to work there. And so that way, if they know what the end pro one of the end products could be, then you may want to do better in classes or Get with somebody that graduated with a degree or teaches what you want to learn, right? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Refocus the community college mission and the redefine institutional roles. Invest in collaborative support structures, which you guys are doing right now. Target public and private investment strategically. And implement policies and practices that promote rigor and accountability. And so some of you might be thinking, how do I do that? Well, it's not just you doing it. It's your president, it's your staff senate, it's your faculty senate, it's your local politicians, it's your state politicians, it's our federal legislators. So key strategies for change. Clear, 
coherent academic pathways. Clear academic, coherent pathways, okay? So what I'm getting myself into will lead me to where I want to be, and in between that time, you're not going to change it on me, right? <laughs> Wrong. The reality is, you know, we change it on them, right? For the most part, some colleges, you start off with a catalog year or, or, or whatever the format is, and then you change it. And so sometimes people get frustrated. They may want to quit because now instead of just taking these classes, they have to take two more classes or they have to take a foreign language. And they already speak all these other languages and they didn't know that you could clip out or do a, another assessment test or a bunch of different, <laughs> different factors. Stackable credentials based on clearly defined competencies. Stackable credentials. Some of these conversations that we're hearing with people in the military who have served, who have created build, uh, uh, is that a warm? No. Okay. Oh, cool. 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 Uh, that have created bridges. You know, what are some of the skills they learned and how is, is that converted into, into credit hours? And then if I start off with my associate's degree in arts, if I want to become a nurse, and, and get my LPN, so I have my two-year degree, or if I want to get my, my BSN, so I have my four-year degree, or my MSN, which we desperately need, then what can I do? Was that for me? Oh, okay. <laughs> Alignment of learning across sectors within community colleges and with labor market demands. Make sure that people know that if they're getting into a degree, a track, that's leading towards an actual job that's going to be there. How many people read Yahoo? So the website, they always talk about the top 10 must bachelor's degrees and the top five don't waste your money, but you're going to waste your money anyways. <laughs> it's really important to make sure that the degrees lead towards a job or whatever the students want. It's really important that the degree leads towards a job that our business and industry leaders need because that grows our communities. One of the, the things that I, I've heard a politician say, or one of our, 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 our leaders, and it's not a derogatory thing, please don't, don't think this is disrespectful, but I may not need a PhD in, in Russian anthropology when I have a factory or I can give people jobs making fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 as welders and all they need is a two-year degree, okay? I don't need somebody to read poetry to me when they can get a start and get their education degree here at Eastfield or at uh, Grayson and then transfer on. So it's make sure that there's a connection. And it's really, really important to make sure that the conversation happens before college. So there are more people that are exposed to it, but that also that some of the things that we're doing are in line with what they're doing in high school and, and, and junior high. How, how much time do I have? Okay, okay, great. Now, okay, transparency and accountability. It's, it's really important that these things are measurable and accountable. Okay. Space jams, I believe I can fly. Okay, so I like that part. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. Right, right spread my wings and yeah, I'm not a good singer. And finally, that's my favorite part, but I think this is the most important verse. If I can see it, then I can be it. If I just believe it, there's nothing to it. Of course, there's a little bit more to it. <laughs> but you give them that inspiration to move, to take that step, to get on that bridge, to talk to somebody, right? I'm wrapping up now, Kyle. He's got, he's got that hope, but I'm, I'm here all day. Okay, so, so what are some high-impact practices? Well, you guys are going to hear about that today, and some of you are already implementing it at your, at your institutions. You know, we're talking about academic goal setting and planning, making sure somebody understands what an associate's degree is, somebody understands what a major is, somebody understands that, you know, if you're getting a two-year degree, you may be able to accumulate some certificates along the way. Okay, orientation, we talked about that. Accelerated or fast-track development education so people can progress within the semester from like a math 55 or one level of math to the next level. Saves time, saves money. First-year experience, student success course, and learning communities. Okay, experiential learning beyond the classroom, making sure people can actually 
experience what they want to do outside of the classroom, give them the opportunities, maybe release them during class or bring a speaker. Tutoring, supplemental instruction, assessment and placement, class attendance, class attendance, class attendance. <laughs> if you're not there, how are you going to be engaged? We have a workplace ethics at my college, so if you miss more than 15%, we withdraw you. If it's before the drop, the, the drop date, you get a W. If it's after the drop date, you get an E. The faculty came up with that. And so I know some people are going, wait a minute, can you do that? We've been doing it for two or three years. We work with our students, but we also want to make sure that they have the skills they need to be successful. And we have advisory boards, and these were recommendations by our community leaders, by our business leaders. And so what we're doing is the skills that they want in the workforce, we're implementing incorporating them. So when our students graduate, they know that they're more than likely going to be there and going to be there on time. Okay, so the experience. I think this is a great way to, to end it. How many people have been to Disneyland, Disney World, watched the Disney Channel? <laughs> like anybody that was on Club Disney or whatever that was. Okay, Justin Timberlake, right? Britney Spears, all those people. So they have the best customer service, right? Best customer service. And it's not accidental. It's intentional. And it's infectious, right? They really want you to feel it. So safety, okay? They want to make sure, because there's a bunch of rides, there's a bunch of people, different kinds of weather conditions, that you're safe. It's important for our employees to be safe. It's important for our students to be safe. To make sure that this environment is there to help them and that we have the resources so they feel comfortable. Because for some, it could be their first experience after high school or after 20 or 30 years of the job or coming back from a bad experience. Safe. Courtesy. Making sure we respect everybody. How many people have dealt with like 100 students in two hours? Or a thousand students in ten minutes, or you get all these emails. Okay, that one student, they don't know what you're going through as an employee. They want their question. It's important that we're respectful, that they're respectful. We need to make sure that we know their names, that they know our names, and that they can connect with us and know how to connect with us. Show. This is all a show. Okay? We all have our issues, whether it's that flat tire or uh, my ACL. But we're here to do a service, and that's to promote teaching and learning, provide access to not only an affordable education, but a quality education, right? That's why you guys are here, affordable, quality, okay? <laughs> to make sure that they have that best experience, not only just events like this, but during, during the entire time, because sometimes somebody's walking at the end of the day, you're really tired, you just want to go home, get the bag going on there, right? You think, of, oh, this person doesn't take care of themselves. This person doesn't respect himself or herself. And, uh, it's important that while we're here, we do our best to make it the great experience in the world. And then efficiency. There are a lot of people coming in and out. And so it's great for us to connect with people. But it's also important for them to know that, hey, we can come and talk at another time that's convenient for you and me. And that this is not the only opportunity that we have to, to sit here or talk here or email each other. So some follow-up. So this is the, the part of our conversations. I know lunch is coming soon, so uh, I'm here and available to talk with anybody who wants to talk. Uh, this is my information. I was a community college student. English is my second language. I came from the Philippines. Didn't know what I wanted to do. Maybe go to the military or go to a college. I had some great people along the way. I had some caring people. A caring sociology professor, a caring history professor when I went to a community college. And that's why I continued. I know you guys here care. Now it's, it's our responsibility to make sure everybody else cares and that everybody puts on the best show to serve the most students so they can reach their goals, right? Well, thank you for being here. It looks like there are a lot of other sessions that are going to talk about technology, about social justice, but also different opportunities to provide student services for our students. So thank you all.